Well, greetings, everybody. Live from Laguna Beach, California. Got the beautiful area over there. Always try to not get people in video shots because one never knows how they feel about it. But hello, everybody. Beautiful Laguna Beach. I think this is one of the first times, truth be told, I've ever seen or ever been at the uh, Pacific Coast here. So I got that in the background. Anna, nice to see you on here. You have told me tales of this Pacific Ocean. Granted, I've seen the Pacific Ocean. I've seen it in Australia. Actually, a lot of this reminds me considerably of Central Coast in Australia, which is a beautiful place. But you can see at the background, even the area here along the mountains, and still mountains, the hills, is really quite breathtaking. But I just wanted to come on very quickly to say hello. I haven't done one of these in a while. And send greetings. I'm in the process right now. <laughs> I'm in the process of a process. I'm in the process of deciphering something that the Lord has given me. For any of you who have read the 2020 Prophetic Words book, um, it's interesting. There are times and seasons where it almost seems like you get a different message, so to speak, every day. And then there are times and seasons where God refuses to let you escape from a certain message. And in that book, and I think it's the first chapter I had this prophetic word about five ways that the devil is trying to turn the church or Christianity upside down. And, uh, well, I've got to 10, and I feel like I can't go beyond that. And I'm in the process of just figuring that out. And listen, I haven't really released it or whatever. I haven't written it up. Only because, listen, I don't want to just give some prophetic word that talks about the ways that the devil is trying to really mess everything up. Because that's a word without a lot of hope. I want to give something where I am right now, and I'm almost there, because I'm, I felt like the Lord told me to share that word as a sermon, as a prophetic message in Scotland next month, in February. Um, because, yeah, it is obvious and it is clear right now that the devil is very intentional on turning Christianity upside down. I don't want to be an alarmist. I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist. I am stating the obvious truth. I just read a New York Times article. I believe it was shared by columnist um, Jonathan Merritt. And it's very interesting because he was talking about that... Uh, he, he was talking about basically that he, there's some sort of New York Times article. Now, obviously, if something is coming from the New York slime, <laughs> New York Times, one should be immediately skeptical. But I always like to see, okay, what's going on here? Well, this article was basically saying that you cannot make a theological or philosophical or moral apologetic for the existence of hell. And I read that, and this guy's obviously sharing that. And then I was just watching Pastor Jack Hibbs, who's not too far away from here in Calvary Chapel, uh, Chino Hills. He just did a sermon this week about false prophets and false teachers. And he had a video at the end, 10, 15 minutes long, of Rob Bell and his book, Love Wins. Now, obviously, I know that's somewhat old news, but this whole demonic, please hear me, demonic doctrine of universalism, I believe, is going to rear its head. It already is in this next season. I hate saying that. On this next season, that's just charismatic language. Um, but I believe it's rearing its head in the evangelical church and hyper grace, this teaching that you're saved and you can like do whatever you want now. I'm, I'm saved. Hallelujah. I accepted Jesus. I came forward and I signed my name on a card and now I can live, or, I, I can live my life however I want to. You know what that, I mean, because God still loves me. Now he loves you. Absolutely. But to even have that perspective is to totally miss the cross, is to totally have no revelation of what the cross does. Yes, I believe the cross and the blood of Jesus absolve us of all sin, past, present, and future. I know some people would like to argue on that, and I think we can have intelligent debate and conversation about that. But here's the deal. In view, as Paul writes in Romans 12, 1, in view of his mercy, it says, I, I love the NIV because I think it's most accurate in translating the Greek language here, in full view of the mercy of God, 
we what? Offer up your life as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. It is not legalism. It's not rules and regulations. It is living in view of what Jesus has done. I'm convinced, and this is one of the 10 things. So one of these 10 things, one of these 10 ways that the devil is turning Christianity upside down is obviously the propagation of this demonic doctrine of universal. At least if I'm talking about some hard stuff, we've got a nice background. But one of the other things is, I believe, a redefinition of what the gospel is. There are people who basically teach and preach that the gospel is God saving you from a junky life. I was kind of living kind of junky. My, you know, I, I woke up and I didn't have purpose and I didn't have meaning. And then I met Jesus. Okay, well, what did Jesus do for you? What are you saved from? Well, I got saved from kind of a mediocre life. If that is one's revelation of the gospel, and if that's the teaching or presentation of the gospel that's going out there, that is categorically false. Those are benefits and those are byproducts. Absolutely, absolutely. When we have Jesus in our life, he fills us with purpose, and clarity, and meaning, 100% absolutely. But you know what? If nobody is preaching about sin, if nobody's preaching the fact that, you know, we were dead in our sins, and now because of what Jesus did, we are alive to God, we are actually in right standing with God. If nobody is preaching that as the gospel, yeah, I know, at least if we're talking hard stuff, we have a nice background. I always want to do it with a smile. I always want to be redemptive. But if, if nobody is preaching that full, clear gospel, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this. The gospel is not signs and wonders either and miracles. Those should be normative. Those should be normative occurrences resulting from someone who has accepted and received and believed the gospel. Absolutely. And I, and I actually believe in the gospel of the kingdom, which comes accompanied with the normalcy and frequency of signs, wonders, miracles, gifts of the Spirit, 100%. But the core of the gospel is while we were dead in our sin, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the gospel. And the deal is this. If we water it down to just this self-actualized gobbledygook where, well, yeah, I kind of had a junky life, but then Jesus came and filled it with purpose and meaning, and I can wake up with a smile and sing a song. You know, if that's what the gospel is, and I know I'm being a little bit crass, and I know I'm I'm probably exaggerating a little bit, but you you guys understand what I'm talking about. If that's, that is not, has nothing to do with whether or not God loves somebody. Has nothing to do with, oh, you know, God loves everybody. Is that, though, is that light, weightless, quote-unquote gospel something worth giving our lives to and giving our lives for. It's not. It's never meant to be. Okay? We give our lives to the gospel. We give our lives in response to the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is what, while we were yet dead in our sin and trespasses, while we were enemies of God, not because God didn't love us, but because of our sin, Christ died for us. That's the gospel. And anyhow, that's... I wanted to share that, and I do believe I, I, did, I didn't really talk about what I put on the um, <laughs> as I put on the on the little tag here. But uh, it's time to step up. It's time to show. It's time to show up and speak up. That's kind of the word that the Lord has given me recently here. So these ten th- those are the things I'm processing, folks. While I'm here in Laguna Beach, is again these ten ways the devil is trying to turn <clears throat> Christianity upside down, while simultaneously. I am seeking the Lord for what are the prophetic solutions and strategies that you and I can implement to actually come against the devices and strategies of the enemy. Number two, and this is the one I've kind of left off at, I, I, I can't escape 1 Kings 17, 1, where Elijah just shows up. What does he do? He shows up onto the scene and he speaks up to King Ahab, who represents the demonic power of that time. I believe the Lord is calling his prophets to show up and to speak up now. One more minute, because I don't have too much phone, and i got to get an Uber to get out of here. Because tonight, folks, please pray for me. I will be, where am I? I'm in this Laguna Beach area. I will be tonight, this evening, uh, Benny Hinn is doing a filming, okay? And I was very graciously invited by one of our authors, David Hernandez, who, Destiny Image author, wonderful next generation leader. Nope. And uh, I'll be there this evening with them. And I'm excited about that. You know what? You mentioned Benny Hinn. 
and people get all sorts of uh, interesting perspectives and say all sorts of things. But you know what? I have such great honor for what that man has sown in the body of Christ. I don't feel like, oh, are you, are you endorsing? Are you supporting Benny Hinn? It's like, here's the reality. We need to be a little bit more intelligent when it comes to, quote unquote, what we define as discernment. Because, you know, you've got so many so-called discernment people wanting to uh, write off everybody as a false teacher and a false prophet. Heck, a lot of these people want to write Billy Graham off as a false teacher and a false prophet. You know why? Well, sometimes it's because of they, uh, well, I don't even have time. They, they blame him for being ecumenical in the sense of connecting with other leaders of different streams. And it's like, you know what? No, we don't connect with people who are believing goofball false doctrine things that are opposed to the fundamental core cornerstone tenets of the faith. Absolutely we don't. But do you know what? We might disagree on some things, but I think we can unite around the core tenets, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, and we advance, and I believe we are going to advance as one or not at all. In other words, we will advance as one unified church, Ecclesia, or we will become very quickly irrelevant, and there will always be a remnant, folks. There's always going to be a remnant out there, praise God, releasing the prophetic word of the Lord. I would just like to see the remnant perhaps be a little bit more uh, increased. And here's the deal. I believe that can be a very sizable remnant. Because at the end of the day, we agree on a whole lot more than we disagree about. So, anyhow, yeah, I agree with you, David. I think, you know, I'm certainly not as, well, let me say this. I went and got my master's degree, a regent oops, school of divinity so that I could be able to give an apologetic for some of these things. So, oops. Because a lot of what we call heresy, false teachers, false prophets is actually wrong and incorrect. So, anyway, that's a whole other story. Got to get out of here. And I got to make sure I turn off the phone so I have time. Well, let's see if I can get over here for one more moment. Taking you on the journey with me today. Oh, I have a little alcove here where I can finish this up. Otherwise, it's like, what the heck are you talking about, Larry? Well... All right, so you've got the background there. I, th I think I saw David Hernandez pop on. David, I'm looking forward to seeing you this evening. And, um, but yeah, that's the word of the Lord that he's put inside of me right now. I can speak that with great confidence and boldness. I believe the Lord is calling forth an Elijah company and collective of people to emerge right now. And this is what I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying. He's saying, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost even as I say this, because this is just in my spirit and I have 100% clarity on this. He's saying that the prophetic voice was never meant for the sidelines. The prophetic voice, the voice of the prophets was actually never meant to be some sort of subculture type of thing. I don't have time to unpack that right now, but here's the reality. I believe the prophetic voice, and this is the language Holy Spirit's given me, it belongs on the main, on the center stage of cultural conversation. Not in a side room, not in this Christian charismatic subculture. Yeah, let's have our conferences and events and our seminars and our training and our equipping, 100%, we need that. But that's not the end goal, that's not the end objective. We need to be having those so we can actually ekbalo to thrust, to send forth laborers into the harvest. And I actually believe that harvest, yeah, it looks like the parking lot where you give somebody a word of knowledge. It also looks like the boardroom where you actually step into the boardroom from the throne room and release supernatural strategies and solutions from heaven. You may not even mention the name Jesus, but guess what? They will actually feel the, feel the fire of God.